Dreams. So welcome everyone. Great to have you here. And it is we're now also being streamed on YouTube. But go ahead and let us know. Um, the chat is disabled. Oh wow! Did I disable the chat? Show chat previews? Huh? What did I do? Well, chat is disabled, but the Q and A is open, and so I'm going to see if I can quickly enable it. Apparently, I can't. So we're going to have. No chat. So you will need to put your questions in the um, Q and A for me. And I apologize about that. That is probably a very deep, very deep in the uh, Zoom settings because it is not easily here. Also, well, Erin figured it out. She's from Charleston, Barbados. Awesome, love it. Um, and I apologize about that chat link, but apparently you can just put it into the Q and A. And um, it's weird. I might. Like it shows that it's working here, so it's very strange. Anyway, uh, anyone else? But you're uh, here. We go. We got people put in the Q and A. Katrina from Jacksonville, Florida. Love it. Happy afternoon to you all there on the east east coast. Um, aha, they are coming in. We've got Valencia, California. Kathy Wexler. Hello. We have worked together. Culver City, Vancouver, Boise, Las Vegas. Oh my goodness. Um, Orem, Orem, Utah. I don't know if you've got that one right. Awesome. South Texas, Kelly, Michigan, Manila, Philippines. Awesome. Fort Lauderdale. Awesome. Katie in LA. Hello. Maui. I wish I were there with you, David. Um, Chattanooga. You know, uh, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. All over the place. Love it. Well, I am so happy. Whoopsie. You've got the wrong screen here up. I am so happy, Alberta. Love it, love it. Everyone is here. Um, I really think this is an important conversation to be having. Um, and I, uh, it's one that I feel like, I mean, partly because of this time in history, um, that talking about pay in this field um, needs to be happening more. And I think most people of most economic um you know, no matter where you're on that economic uh, hierarchy there, unless you're at the very top sliver, which I think most mental health professionals are not, um, the just the cost of living, the cost of housing, everything that we've gone through with the pandemic, cost of energy. I just got my, those of us in California, we just had a record-breaking 10-day heat wave, and I just got my electric bill from that. That was, that was, that was a fun bill to open. Um, but I think we need to be talking about, I think, a lot of the struggles for those of us who work in this field. And I think we're very, very good at taking care of others. Um, but I think taking care of ourselves and is a much harder thing to do and advocating for ourselves. And, and so I, what I want to do today is to kind of touch on a taboo subject, I think, for a lot of us. I, I've never had, can't even think of a mentor or a supervisor and hardly even a colleague in the field who, who is going to talk, who's talked about what I'm calling the hourly pay prison. Um, and it's something that certainly when I got into it, I, I saw problems. And I know many of my students graduating. <laughs> I am actually next week, we are in the next few weeks in my course, I'm meeting with the, those who are graduating or looking at pay as they go out into the field and People are starting to do budgets and realizing, oh, my God, um, we're not going to make a lot of money out there, given that we have these expensive master's degrees now. And I think we need to be talking about it, thinking about it and um, and to be real honest about it, because I know I was shocked, like many of my graduate students were shocked when I entered the field. I'll tell you a little bit about that. And I certainly entered the field you know, 25 years ago when economic times were were better, much better. Um, and I will just share a little bit about my journey, but then looking at some of that dynamics um, of how we get paid and the problem with how we get paid in this field, and then proposing at least three solutions, or and you can mix and match those solutions together. So let's go ahead and get started. So why is this a secret? The pay in mental health is really quite low. Given the level of training we need to go through, you need a master's degree to do this work. And we'll look at some of the numbers in just a minute here. And we also have a medical license. We're professionals who need to continually get training. 
Um, we need to maintain our licenses. There's insurance. There's a lot that goes into what we do. Um, so given the level of education and, and that we have a medical license that costs money, I always tell my students budget, you know, five to 10% of what you make, especially in those first 10 years, it's going to go back to just sustaining your ability to work. Um, and so it really does when you, when you put it all into a spreadsheet, it is relatively low for the level of, of training we need to maintain and the, the level of training and the level of education you need to just get here. So today we're going to talk a little bit about, I'm going to share a little bit about my story. Um, and then I'm going to, we're going to talk about the problem, how we get trapped in our billable service hours and why this is such a problem for how we get paid. And then I'm, we're going to talk about three different strategies for breaking out. Um, and hopefully you'll find at least one of those, if not all three, that can work for you. Um, we'll talk about positioning yourself for the future with some of the changes um, that are rapidly happening in our field. And I will be sharing a little bit about my new course, Beyond the Hour, for those of you who are interested in, um, in you know, some of the things we're going to be talking about today. And I will say, if you stay on, there is a special bonus at the end of the course, if you stay on till the end of this uh, live webinar. My way of saying thank you. So, how I got here. I graduated with a doctoral degree in 1997. I got a full-time faculty position. For those of you who don't know, the first time you start teaching, you were, you were working 50, 60 hours a week, easy. And back then, no one gave you PowerPoints. You had to create them all. Um, but I also had a part-time clinical position, um, you know, where I saw five clients a week. And But still, that was out of eight hours with paperwork and all the good stuff. I graduated with 50,000 in student debt, which would be about 192,000 today. I ran it through a calculator there, which I think is a familiar number for students coming out of a graduate program with a master's degree. Today, a lot of my students end up with that type sort of debt. But I, I lived in Fresno, which is a pretty, you know, agricultural kind of center in uh, California with a much lower cost of living. But 25 years ago, I actually bought a house down for a house for $8,000 down, which is $15,000 in today's money, which I do not believe any of my students could possibly do, even if they moved to Fresno at this point in history. So definitely, you know, I, I entered the field. Um, I was working a lot from the beginning. I've always had a, a, an employee position and a small practice um, that's pretty standard for faculty, but it's also because faculty, they have doctorates and don't get paid, paid much more um, than master level uh, folks. So that they, you end up with even more debt and not much more uh, money to pay for that when my students are like, should I get a doctorate? I'm like, if you're gonna find a way to pay it off, yeah. <laughs> um, because that it even, if you have a doctorate and you're listening to this, this, these problems we'll talk about today are even bigger um, for that degree. Um, I had immigrant parents. So my, my parents, grew, I mean, semi-migrant goat herders in Greece is where my mom's side came from. And my dad's side was extremely agrarian. My, my dad's family actually literally had oxen in a very rural part of uh, Austria. Um, so they came from very rural, poor backgrounds, you know, a very typical American immigrant, um, but they didn't have a lot of wealth building knowledge, basically get a job, work really hard. And that's, you know, and that's really all the advice I got, which is not bad advice, you know, get a job, get a stable job, you know, that you're employed, um, and just work really hard. But that, that was kind of the advice I got, but there wasn't a lot of sophistication. And, I'm, and I know many people listening today probably had you know, parents um, who didn't have a lot of um, information to give. And this is an issue for those of us who come from parent, you know, when you come from a, a, um, a more poor background, they're off, there's all, not only is there not wealth to pass down, but often there's not enough knowledge. And so hopefully you'll get a little bit of that today. I'm gonna be giving you some spreadsheets. Um, but I was very surprised when I got my doctor in my first big job. I was 27. I had just been a student my whole life. And I thought, finally, I'll be able to afford something, right? I lived in a tiny studio apartment with a Murphy bed in grad school. I, um, I never, you know, you don't, I hardly had any money in grad school. I thought, finally, I have the big job. This is going to be great. I can finally live. And I was really stunned 
you know, that I still had trouble. I couldn't afford to eat out very often. I couldn't stop in by Starbucks still was more than was comfortable. Um, most, you know, going to movies, things like that were just really hard to do. Most forms of self-care, like seriously, I never got <laughs> manicures or pedicures till about five years ago or, um, and then any type of all my travel, my entire life has always been related to a conference so I could write it off. We'll talk a little bit about that today. So and, and I think a lot of my students have expressed the same thing. It's like, oh, my God, I just went through how many years, you know, 16, 18, 20 years of education, whatever it's been. And you finally get the big job. You have this big master's degree. You're working on a medical license. Like, finally, I'm going to find this financial relief and freedom. And you're like, it was it was stunning to me. I, I had no idea um, how much I was going to struggle. And you can see I paid less for housing than most people, than we all are paying today for housing. Um, because I actually entered into a time where the cost of living wasn't as bad, I would say, as it is today. Uh, and still, it was very, very, it was a struggle. Um, and when my students look at me, I'm like, yeah, you're going to still need a roommate of some kind to, to make this all work, or you're going to have to live further and further out. Um, away from the city center in Los Angeles, if we have a city center, that's a whole other issue. Um, okay, there we go. And I think one thing I, I don't hear talked a lot about um, is that there is, there's been a substantial drop in the in the standard of living, you know, what the average working class family can afford for decades now. Um, in fact, and just quality of life has dropped significantly. I mean, we are now behind Estonia, the Czech Republic, Cyprus, and Greece. So, I mean, you know, we've dropped multiple rankings just in the last decade. And, and so I think, you, you know, you look around and it doesn't look necessarily like the standard of living is, <laughs> is rapidly dropping in the United States. But if you look at people's bank accounts and understand what kind of debt people are in, um, it, it becomes much more real. And so I remember for, for decades, I'm like, I don't understand why people aren't riding, riding in the streets over just the cost of living, the standard of living, how much you have to work to actually make a living. Um, it's a real struggle. And I think it's something we need to talk about so that People have reality checks because um, uh, I think there's I've actually talked about this with some of my clients who are like feeling imprisoned in their own you know work life, especially once you're trying to raise a family. You've got you've got all these people depending on you, and the cost of I mean the average cost of a child is thirty thousand dollars three hundred thousand dollars, and that's before you send them to college before the year of eight you know they turn eighteen. The average child in the United States costs a family $300,000 before you throw in college tuition, car, you know, anything after 18. That's a, you know, that's about a half a million. If you're going to send your kid to college, that's a lot of money to come up with, <laughs> especially, and then you've got two, that's an extra million dollars the average family will be spending. And we just aren't talking about this. And I think it is because I've, I've, I've worked with clients who this is actually a clinical issue. And I think it's a very personal issue for those of us in this field. So, um, and what really has helped me is early, relatively early in my career, I discovered what passive income is, which I did through my books. And um, so my first book was published in 2002, Theory-Based Treatment Planning. Um, and around that time, I, I took a series of intensive trainings, actually with Bill O'Hanlon, who's my mentor, on writing books, on speaking, and using the internet to um, to make money, and I I spent a lot on those. It was about nine thousand back in the day, which is about sixteen thousand today. I was had fun doing that when I put this all together. But learning and understanding what passive income was, this was nothing. My parents, my hardworking immigrant parents, did not tell me about passive income. I think it's an important thing to understand. Um, and over the years, my passive income has, you know, become almost half of my income. And I really have made the money back from that early investment many years ago. And so yeah, historically in the field, though, the problem is you had to write a book, which not everyone is able to do. And um, but that was I was lucky enough to be able to get into book writing. I also have YouTube videos, which, um, you know, they bring in a little extra income. And we'll talk about that. 
but it, it really is nice to just have income coming in, even if it's not, you know, huge amounts. Um, it's a couple thousand maybe a year, but who would turn down a couple thousand dollars a year? I, I'm not going to turn it down. I actually created online assessments and now I've started creating online courses. And by so I really feel like I need to supplement the mental health um, income I get with some other form of income to live in an area like Los Angeles. And so the one thing I will say is learning how to generate some form of passive income really has been the best investment of my life. Um, I do have someone who helps me invest in the, <laughs> my, my retirement money, but um, the dividends that you get pay, pay off from these types of, of learning how to create something that creates passive income for you um, really has been financially rewarding, but also personally, because I, I think there is, you know, book, I love book writing. I mean, it's not totally passive. I spent 10 hours a day this summer working on writing some of my books that will be coming out next year. Um, but I love it. It is a passion. It's creative. And it really helps counterbalance and reduce burnout from everything I do as a professor, as well as a mental health provider during these really difficult times. And that's the other thing that I really like about having multiple ways to make money. You know, and the honest truth is, even with supplementing my income, um, you know, I, I still have to very closely monitor my spending. I live in Los Angeles. I rarely turn my AC on until it, you know, hits 95 degrees around here. Um, because I don't like, I don't, it costs a lot of money. I just got the bill from our like heat wave. It was, you know, 200 extra dollars to run that darn machine, which is why I normally don't do that. And, um, but in all areas, you know, even with, I'm very senior in the field. I have written books. I am a full-time professor. I've been doing that for 25 years. I have like many of us, a very active practice uh, with the pandemic and still having to be very, very careful about how I spend everything because the cost of living is so incredibly high. And, and I know that depresses my students to realize, oh my God, you're still counting pennies. I'm like, yeah, kind of still am. Um, obviously not in the way my students are, but it's not like the money problem just kind of goes away because the cost of living is just increasingly going up. The housing shortage is just so depressing, I think, for many of us. Um, it, it's really a challenge. And so we really have to be looking and, and, and thinking about how and positioning ourselves. And we just have lots of choices. There are choices we all have in this very difficult financial reality we all find ourselves in. You know, there are a lot of choices. Unfortunately, they're not always choices we like in terms of having to work more to make more or to figure out how to live on less. They're not always great choices. Um, but at the very least, um, I mean, and there's advocacy. I think the system is, is concerned me for decades. I It's good to hear other people talk about how the cost of living for the average person is really um, it's not sustainable. It is highly problematic. There's a lot of injustice and um, there's just a lot of problems. Um, but that said, and so that's at the societal level. And I do hope our society comes together to find some solutions. But in the meantime, you know, you got to pay your monthly electricity bill and find housing, which is increasingly difficult. Um, and so knowing that this is this is not something a problem that easily goes away, I think, over time in our lives. And so I think kind of looking at our field uh, specifically, um, the average person coming up with a four year bachelor's degree makes fifty five thousand dollars. And then when you look at the folks coming out of mental health, so a master's degree in mental health, the average person, in the, you know, makes around sixty thousand. And prior to the pandemic, um, I can tell you last year, the average in L.A. was 60,000. The year before that, so it was 2021, it was 60,000. In 2020, it was um, it was around 50,000. I mean, it was 55,000. And before that, you were barely breaking 55 years before. So our salaries have definitely come up in the pandemic. And as we all know, inflation has kind of wiped out most of that gain. But the salaries have been very close to what you would be getting or be able to earn with a bachelor's degree, but now you, you have $70,000 in loans, or at least many people come out of um, grad school with these huge student loans and about the same amount that you would be making. So it, you, when, when you start paying back your student loans and you do a little spreadsheet on this, you're making a little bit less than um, bachelor's, people coming out with a bachelor's degree. And that's a problem in our field. 
So let's talk about what this looks like. So I, we have, you know, it's a twofold problem that we have in this field. The first problem that is very obvious once you get into this field and look at how you get paid is that we get paid for billable hours only. We're only getting paid for the time with our clients. Now, even if you are, let's say, working in an agency and you have a salary, so yes, you have to work 40 hours a week, but most of the time you have a pretty strict, you're seeing 25 to 30 hours really is your billable hours. You have to hit that mark because ultimately that's how your agency is getting paid. So even if you personally have a salary of 40,000, your agency only makes money on those billable hours. And we all know there are a lot of other hours that we are working that we don't get paid for because we're not paid for the documentation, the time to schedule, most of our phone calls, texts, and emails between sessions, you know, consulting, you know, or getting formal supervision. You're, you're not getting paid to sit there usually as a supervisee or no, you're not making, bringing in any money to the agency. Let's just say that. Um, but just the research and the prepping. So there's so much work that we do about 25, you know, 25% of our work hours. Um, you know, either our agency's not bringing in or if you're in private practice, you're not bringing in money for that time. So and so let's look at what happens um, in private practice. And there is this mid-career pay ceiling. Now that I'm mid-career, me and my friends and colleagues have been talking a lot more about this problem. And it's pretty terrifying, quite frankly. So what happens in this field is that mid-career, you hit an hourly max of how much you can charge in, in a private practice. So this is in a private practice setting. Um, and it, it affects agencies, but a much higher level, normally not at the individual employee level, because it, but it affects agencies too. There's, there's a max that third-party payers are willing to pay out. There's a max that your clients, you know, who pay cash out of pocket are willing to pay out. And so, and even if you're an agency, there's a max that third-party payers are going to reimburse you. There's just a max that the, you're going to get paid per hour for a clinical hour. So let's say you start pre-licensed, you know, you can in a, if you're able to do private practice in your state, it's maybe around 75 in your early licensure years, let's say you, you hit 125, maybe you get to 150 for your average session. Um, once you're out of, you know, once you've established your practice, and let's say you live in an area, not all areas in LA, but for certainly like 200 is, is around one of the top average. You can fill a practice with 25 to 30 clients per week at 200 bucks an hour. Let's just say you live in an area, that's your regional max. The problem is, and you're good, if you're a good clinician, you will hit that rate in, you know, about 10 years of, of building your private practice up, you really can. And, and what happens is then you're like, you're making good money because you, you got to keep about half of that by the time you pay the government and your overhead. But you're, you're easily making, you know, 150 to $200,000 um, early in your career. And if you have an act, if you're able to build a, a, a thriving private practice, you make good money for the first 10 to 15 years. And then what happens is you hit this uh, mid-career crisis because you can't raise your rates at the same rate that inflation is going up. The market won't sustain it. And so what happens is, and I, I mean, this has happened to many, many clinicians I know in the Los Angeles area, is they have this, you know, they're able, they're, they're good clinicians, they're able to, you know, fill a, fill a practice, make decent money, make top dollar around. And then after, you know, they, let's say they do that year 10, by year 20, though, you can see how their income has dropped because they have not been able to raise their rates to keep up with inflation. And now it's almost half of what they were making a decade before, which is stunning. When I read the, I ran these numbers multiple times, I'm like, whoa, but this, I know someone who has had to downsize their home mid-career because they couldn't keep up with the cost of raising their children in the home. They've had, they had to move to a different part of town. They had to sell their home literally because they couldn't make ends meet because the cost of food and, you know, raising kids was so high. I know other people who are adding hours, they're going up to 35 hours. And it's, and these, some of these people are working with Holly, they have Hollywood, you know, actor and actress practices they're they're hired by, you know by some very high paying clients and they're still to keep up with the cost of living they they have to take on more hours or sell their homes um 
or drastically change their standard of living. It is, I know lots of people who are having to do this. I, I have one, um, I know one person who's actually up to seeing 40 clients per, per week during the pandemic because they've never saved for retirement that finally they have a way to do it through the pandemic, but they're burning themselves out. And so this is a real problem. I, I it's just stunning, jaw dropping. And, um, and it's weird, even as we're all talking, I'm talking about it with my friends. It's like, we're not, we don't have the spreadsheet in front of us to explain why, why, why are we here financially? Why is this so difficult? And so, and this is, this is when you adjust it for a 2.4 cost of living, which is what the social security um, kind of estimates it at. So, so that is a problem. Even if you're very good at what you do, the way we get paid on these hourly rates, you can't keep raising your rates at the, at the, um, uh, at the rate of in, that inflation goes up. So um, yeah, and you can see here, if you actually adjusted your fee, um, you would need to be charging, you know, $361 per hour, <laughs> um, you know, at the end of your career. And, and we all know that I can tell you, well, if you've been in the field a while and no one's raised their rates that much from 20 years ago till today, it just, it would not happen. Because what actually happens, and when you look at what insurance is reimbursing, um, I was in network from 97 to 2010, and there was a 10% increase in some of the panels. I actually had a zero, I was $60 reimbursement. Um, this is Blue Shield. Um, for over a decade, there was no raise. And, and that's why, you know, why can't you find in network providers? Well, who would not take a, who would not insist on a raise for 10, 14 years? It was, it was crazy. Um, and of course, you know, every year my landlord is raising the, just the, you know, the rates of the, um, of how much you make. Um, I mean, how much I have to pay. It's stunning to me, even after the pandemic, we're renegotiating our commercial lease and I'm like, they're raising our rates 10%. I'm like, wait, no one's using office buildings. Uh, how is it that our, our rent is going up? It's dramatically, right? So the rent keeps going up, the cost of everything keeps going up, but the, you know, you can look at when insurance are reimbursing you, they don't keep up with the cost of inflation. So inflation over that period was actually 36%. And some of my insurance reimbursement went up 10%. And so this is this is when you start looking at whether you're at an agency now or in a private practice, it almost doesn't matter because what you're being reimbursed is not keeping up with all of your other costs. Um, so there was a functionally a 26% decrease in all of my, you know, my payment from um, insurance companies over those 14 years that I was in network. So now let's say, okay, I don't want to go that route. That looks really depressing. Let's go get a, a salary job. Um, and so here's what you're looking at. And I have some different numbers depending on when you started. Um, and um, so the good news is, is that even though you start pretty low in terms of um, income, given your level of education, that over you know 20 years, you should see a 45% increase in your salary. But the bad news is most people are not getting a 2.4% bump um, where they're working, at least most of the people that my students tell me, and what my certainly my experience at the university, that was not the case. Um, but look, you're never even approaching what, uh, you know, someone working in, um, in private practice is making even after 20 years. And so that's the downside of this. I mean, the good side, is, the good side of being employed, though, is then you create a lifestyle that you know is much more sustainable compared to people who do private practice and do well early in their careers. You really hit this pay ceiling that creates a huge financial crisis in the second half of your career. But it's very hard if you live well, in most parts of the country now. It's hard to find a, an affordable place to live anywhere in the United States if you're from the United States. I know we got folks from all over. Um, it really creates a crisis. Now, if you do get a, in some states, you get a 10%, uh, you have to wait to get, um, take that exam and you get a, a nice raise with licensure. But it, so you do get a raise with licensure, which is nice. And you can see over 20 years, you get about a, a $10,000 increase, which is great. So it helps a little bit. It's still not, it's still not quite even getting you where you would like to be to live comfortably in today's world. So the most common solutions, um, a lot of people just work more hours. Um, and certainly in private practice, that is what you're going to see a lot of um, organizations. When I first got into the field um, and I, uh, there was 
billable, a, a normal work week was about 20 to 22 hours. And that is, I literally, that's what I learned in grad school. You should be seeing 20 clients per week. And most of my students end up in, in agencies where they're seeing 30 clients an hour if they're doing it via telehealth or um, someone's coming to the office. If you're doing home visits, it's less, like 25. But so even agencies have had to do what people in private practice are doing, which is you're having to work more hours to just make ends meet because they offer the, the agency itself and insurance has a pay ceiling. And that is why the number of hours in agencies, what is required has gone up dramatically over the 25 years that I have been in the field. Because when I entered the workload in an agency setting was far more reasonable than they are today. And it's exhausting. It's very exhausting work. Um, Getting a side job, and we're going to talk about that um, today and how to do that in a way that's skillful, but a side job, and I know many, um, and others just decide to lower their standard of living. And of course, um, the other answer is always to marry rich. And, and, and it's true, if you have a partner who is able, you know, who's in a higher paid field, these issues are less of a problem for you. Um, and, and so it does make a big difference. But if you're having to support yourself by yourself um, or you're the primary, you know, breadwinner in your household, um, you know, it, it's much more of a struggle. So let's talk about the three keys to breaking out. So three keys. Um, one is to own a business. And we're going to talk about why. This is one thing I didn't learn from my parents. <laughs> Um, the other is to specialize in high-end interventions. We'll talk about some of those. And the other is to create passive income through some form of content creation. So owning a business. So um, there is a significant difference um, in owning a business in the general population. The average employee makes around 55. The average business owner makes around 97. And we see this in mental health in terms of working in an agency setting versus working in a private practice. So what we see that the huge difference in income is very, very real. Um, and, it, and it's mirrored in all other industries as well. And so here's one thing um, in terms of owning a business that I, you know, many people don't understand. I certainly was not taught this is that when you own a business, business expenses come out of this pre-tax income, which gives you, depending on your tax rate, right, something like 20 to 30% off everything you buy, off your phone, off your, you know, if you're going to a conference in Hawaii, right, you can write that off. Um, so you get 30% of whatever percentage of your home um, that you're using, you can write that off. Whatever you know, travel you do um, for, with your vehicle, you can write off those miles. In fact, you can actually, if you um, have an office someplace, you can actually write off your vehicle. Um, so all of you know, your computers, your your phones, your you know, your internet, all anything you're using, you get you get a huge discount on that. And that is one of the reasons why a lot of financial advisors just say to to actually become wealthy, you must own a business in some way. Um, and here are some websites that you can look at to kind of run some of those numbers. So some of the pros are when you own a business like a private practice, there is just significant tax savings on top of the fact that you're making usually a higher um, income. There's just more flexibility and control. And the downside is, is that you, you do have to be highly responsible um, the income is less reliable and stable. So when there are recessions, um, like in 2008, uh, when there was a major recession, a lot of people in private practice struggled significantly. And you do have to you know, learn a lot about business, marketing, you know, managing a business is a lot of work and a different skill set. And so, um, so yeah, there's a lot of pros. The potential for income is definitely higher, but it's not as stable of income. And so one of the um, things that a lot of people end up doing in our field is you, you have a full-time job, especially early in your career. If you, have to, if you have to pay your rent and buy your own food and, and your income needs to be stable, there's not someone else in your household help, helping to support you. Um, you know, having a full-time job with a small private practice is a very common in this field. And part of the reason is because you can um, 
you, you get not just that little bit of income, but you get the benefit, the financial benefits of owning a business um, and, and getting to save money in that way as well. So that is probably the number one way people do this. And I know some of my, um, uh, you know, some of my students have said, I don't want to have to work that hard. And, and you don't have to, but then you, you, you have to look at what you, what you're able to make and, and where you can find a job that gives you enough to live off of entirely without having a, a side gig. It doesn't always have to be huge, that side gig, but a little, it can make, even just seeing, you know, clients three hours, one night a week can be surprisingly helpful financially. So now let's look at um, specializing in high-end interventions, because this is another way I have seen people um, yeah, yeah, uh, make money um, in, in the field. And this is another way I've seen a lot of people who hit that mid-career pay ceiling, who have no retirement and they're realizing they're in trouble. I have seen this work um, in that situation. So, um, so one is to get into testing, psychological testing, family assessments, forensic assessments for the courts, um, that sort of thing. You definitely have a higher hourly wage. There's a lot more pressure. You do need to be good at writing um, and you're testing. Some people really hate that. Other people love it. So, but it's certainly going to pay you more. When my students say, should I go get a doctorate, you know, in psychology and they come out of the MFT program and like, if you want to do psychological testing, sure, because you'll make enough to pay off those doctoral loans. But if you just want to do talk therapy, even a psychologist doesn't get paid much more than mental health providers. And you'll see most, many, many psychologists now end up doing a lot of psychological testing to pay back their very large amount of loans. Um, neurofeedback. And so a neurofeedback is another specialty I've seen a lot of people use um, to make money. Um, it does cost a lot of money to get trained and to buy the equipment initially. There is an investment, but it is one I have seen many people actually uh, make good money doing. Because um, sometimes, you know, I've seen people even set it up so there's more than one person after being seen at a time. And so that can be a very um, lucrative way to also, I mean, a specialization. And then slightly more for couples therapy, a lot of that is definitely an area to specialize in where you can charge more for that. And then EMDR, brain spotty, those are also specialties. I have seen people, you know, make more money in these areas because clients are willing to pay for it. So um, so when you look, think about specializing in high end, um, what's nice about it, it's the closest to what you're already doing. So if you don't want a lot of change, specializing in um, the high end interventions is just going to, OK, just go specialize, you know, in EFT for couples or EMDR. And it's going to be the closest to what you probably got into this career to do. Um, and the potential challenges are they tend to be a lot more structured. And some folks I know in this field don't like that amount of stru uh, stru um, structure. There is less variety in your workload. And so seeing a lot of couples can be uh, stressful. <laughs> Find couples to be, I oh, love working with couples, but ooh, a whole caseload that can be, um, you know, there's less variety. And I think variety helps keep us from burning out. Often there is extensive training that does take time and money. Um, there's often the challenge, the clients are more challenging, you know, uh, working with uh, high conflict couples is the, I've, I've decided they're the most draining ones, clients I've got. Um, so, and, and these just may not be, you know, EMDR couples, um, testing, forensic work may not be of interest um, to, some, so to some folks. So then let's look at um, passive income content creation. Um, so, so what this is, is you're creating some kind of either virtual or intellectual property. We used to only, we used to do books. And what, what, I, what I think is so phenomenal now in the last 10 years, what used to, you almost had to be an academic to be able to, to write a book or create some kind of content that people will pay for. Um, that now it is, it is available to anyone, I think, who has got the training of a master's degree. And so, but what passive income is, you create something once and normally the first amount of creation, you know, you're doing that, you, you're, you're not making a whole lot that first year, I'll be honest. You're putting in tons of hours. Um, but what happens is af after a while, though, you know, for example, with YouTube, you 
it, you have to um, create those videos. That takes a lot of time and effort. You put them on. You have to wait till your time. You know, you spend be on there long enough to get till it gets monetized. But once it's monetized, that video you created 10, 20 years ago can still earn you small residual income which is kind of nice. It, it's very nice. So work from years ago can keep paying, keeps paying. Um, and like I said previously, this was very, it was a very limited option to have any type of passive income in the field, which was primarily book royalties, because even speaking is not passive income, um, for sure. So book royalties used to be the only way to do this. And so what's exciting now is that any licensed or, you know, anyone, mental health professional in the licensing track and the licensing world, your medical professional, you know, all the way through, that you have opportunities to generate income now through YouTube and social media, through online courses, and what is called hybrid or blended therapy. And this is a real exciting area um, that is rapidly growing. And just like historically, I mean, most of the people doing hybrid therapy, which I'll talk, will, uh, it, which is where there is some pre-recorded online interventions as well as traditional telehealth or face-to-face -face therapy combined real-time and pre-recorded, is this hybrid, again, is a form of um, creating a passive income because you do your psychoed intervention once and then you're able to make money off of it in one way or another, either by charging more for it or selling it as a separate product um, than before. So really are some exciting options here. Um, and what is so excited, uh, exciting to me is this whole new area of hybrid interventions. And these are where you record, think of all of the psychoeds you give your clients um, in terms of how to manage anxiety, how to um, with couples, you know, psychoeducation around couple conflict. I do a lot of that type of work. Um, you know, uh, how to deal with panic, how to do mindfulness. We, we all have these little spiels we give, these little mini lessons we give. And what we are, what the, and the research behind these is just stunning and a little disturbing, quite honestly, in the fact that many, many of the 100% online interventions were just as, had similar, I mean, the same outcomes as face-to-face -face traditional therapy. Um, that was stunning. Um, but they're extremely um, effective hybrid interventions, whether used um, with some kind of live therapist or not. I, I think there were several studies that I don't understand that I saw that were just stunning where they did these hybrid interventions with college students. So basically gave college students at the beginning of the academic year um, an online course on how to manage stress and anxiety and depression. And it had the same outcomes in terms of helping students reduce their uh, anxiety as those who are actually getting counseling through counseling services on the campus from a real therapist. Totally pre-recorded. I don't understand why every university in the country is not offering this and actually every high school should be offering it as well because they work and they work surprisingly well. Um, obviously, we're never going to do away with therapists, but there is the concept here is, is that hi in hybrid work, um, we're reducing the cost to clients and there is a reduced cost. You know, you can sell these to the general public also, um, but there's increased income for the clinicians who either can sh charge more per hour or charge for a standalone product um, as well, like selling a book basically is what you're doing. And so it's a win-win for everyone because, and I don't see with the workforce shortage that we have now that um, some version of this is going to become increasingly common because there's just not enough of us to do one-on-one -on -one therapy with everyone who needs it. Um, and what's really nice too is that these online courses also become a way to market yourself. Most people in this industry hate marketing. Um, but what is nice about these online courses, if they're on your website where your clients are, you know, your clients are using the courses, they can send their friends to them. And it also establishes you as someone who has an expertise. And so it becomes this very easy way to position yourself as an expert. And I, I think so many people who do this work really are experts. And because they don't have that little book behind their name, right, um, book title or they don't get to, it's not clear that they're experts. And, and these courses become a very easy way 
to showcase your expertise, to bring people in, to market, to expand the number of people you're actually able to help. And it becomes a lot easier for clients to meet you. And one of the things we know is that, um, you know, clients who feel marginalized um, actually find these hybrid interventions a lot easier than traditional face-to-face. -face. They're just far more convenient. They can do it on their own schedule because many of them are working multiple jobs, right, and juggling a lot. Um, but there, you also don't have to face some of the barriers of like trying to figure out whether or not this is going to connect with this therapist and they're going to understand me. Um, there's a lot more autonomy and choice in how you use professional information. So, so the pros really are, um, if you want to do some of this, is that it really is a creative process. Whether you're writing a book, whether you're creating a YouTube video, whether you're creating an online course, um, and doing a TikTok, there's a whole uh, therapist getting into TikTok now, but it really um, is a creative process. And so you, you do get, and you do get to create, um, have this passive income. And ultimately you'll be working fewer hours, not necessarily in the beginning, but over time. But I do think the creation and creativity that goes into um, creating content is a really healthy counterbalance to um, the very heavy emotional toll that our work takes on us. Creativity kind of fuels the soul. And I wouldn't say our, our, our work is definitely not soul sucking, but it is draining. It is, it is emotionally, it can be very emotionally draining to do this work and being creative um, is, is very much refreshing to the soul. I mean, just for me, like the PowerPoints, I love creating beautiful PowerPoints now. It's like art, it, it, it lifts my spirits when I get to put all the pretty photos into my PowerPoints. Um, and, and being creative and doing research, learning what's out there. And so, and what's really exciting is that these newer models really require far less time um, and money than, you know, traditionally what we had available. Because when I, when you write a textbook, if you're interested in writing a textbook, it is, you spend, it's about four years uh, and two years of solid writing. And it's about four years to see, before you see your first paycheck um, from writing a book very delayed gratification, um, where with these newer methods like TikTok and YouTube and online courses, you do not need to wait nearly that long um, to start seeing some of that income come in. And the cons, obviously, if you're looking for ways to make money immediately, quickly, uh, starting a small private practice is probably better. Um, and there is work and investment and time and money up front. And you do have to learn, obviously, new skill sets that are more different, um, certainly than doing a high-end specialization. But I would say it's very similar to what you would need to do to start a practice. So the future, hybrid therapy. And I think if you talked to any of us five years ago, none of us ever would have thought telehealth was going to work. <laughs> um, we didn't think that was going to be the way of the future. Um, even during the pandemic at the beginning, I think most of us were like, yeah, we'll be back in the office in a few months. Um, and it's about 80 to 85% of psychotherapy they're estimating is going to remain telehealth. And uh, I was stunned to see that because that wasn't the first estimate. This was a more recent estimate I saw, and I think it was to the APA, American Psychological Association. Um, but if I look at my practice, I look at what my students are doing and our, what our field work, work sites are doing. 80 to 90 percent um, telehealth is, is probably where it's going to be. And I think we're seeing the exact same thing with hybrid therapy. I was stunned when I started doing uh, looking at the research on these interventions. I thought there would be a modest, mild, you know, um, but it, it, it's the research is stunning on hybrid therapy. We will be forced to do it whether we want to or not, just like telehealth, whether we wanted to or not, you were doing it. And the future is going to be hybrid therapy because it's the most logical, it's the best use of everyone's resources, time, and money. So putting the three, um, three keys together, owning a business, becoming a specialist, and content creation, that really is what hybrid therapy is. Um, and I, it's a very exciting um, time. There are um, in, in the field, and you will see that a lot of, I was stunned to learn that both of the major evidence-based couples therapies already have 100% pre-recorded programs online, both Sue Johnson's Hold Me Tight and um, uh, Integrated Behavioral Couples Therapy have 
fully built out, you know, programs. Um, there are lots of CBT programs. There is DBT. There is an entire pre-recorded EMDR I, uh, where basically you're not even seeing an EMDR therapist. Uh, it is all pre-recorded. So this is, we, you know, I don't think, I still think we all are going to have jobs. I'm not worried about that at all, but learning how to be much more effective in how we use our time and how we use our clients' time. Um, and what hybrid therapy is doing is that you are supplementing live sessions, typically that's the hybrid part, with a mini course, with videos, with handouts, with links to high quality resources. You just think about it. You know, if you have a problem, I, I typically do go to Amazon, look for books, and I buy three or four. And, you know, it's usually one or two is all I actually needed. And I, I try to start that way. And so, and that's what most people do. 95% of people, they have a problem. They go to Google. They don't go to their doctor. And, and this is this is naturally kind of what the internet has done to how people look for help. The first thing they do is not call us, they go online. And so, but when I've started creating some of my own um, hybrid interventions, and it really has been nice. Like I got to do, I, I did one on parenting, where it was, first of all, I'm just so much more thorough because when you're doing it in session, which I do a lot of, you know, it's, it's a little bit here, a little bit there. And you sometimes I end up doing it, you squeezing it in at the end of session. And I, there was not press for time. I could talk as long as I wanted. I could give them printed handouts, which I only have a couple normally, but I could give them so much more information in a much more structured way. And I don't have to sit there and repeat, you know, how to manage behaviors or, you know, build secure attachment and all that stuff. And they, they got a much more thorough description of, of the information I wanted to share than what I could ever possibly give them in session, you know. And now we can use the session to talk about how to implement this in their life. Similarly, I did one around anxiety and depression, and I was able to actually think through it so much more clearly in the sense of I'm like, okay, if someone's anxious and they want you know, to know how to handle their anxiety better, how do we do this? And so I was very strategic and like, okay, there's this type of intervention that uses this approach. And I was able to lay out the three most common ways I have clients, you know, help them. I've seen work to have them deal with their anxiety. It's described in so much more detail than I could possibly do in session because you don't have time. And now they have it clearly laid out and they have three choices and they can choose and experiment and own it. It's just a much better way to do any type of psychoeducation is to, you know, have enough time to do it you know, to explain it in the full depth you want to, not to have my sessions ending in two minutes. I got to wrap this up. Um, and then the clients can come in and we process it together. We, we apply it together. It's a much more effective way to do this. And I had one client, um, one of my earliest experiences with, with this was when I um, started using Zoom during telehealth. I had a client who was um, struggling with very severe seasonal depression, severe. She was at a top university, brilliant person, but had to drop out because her seasonal depression was that bad. And um, so, and when I uh, gave her one of these online interventions and she got the form to use, we had actually done this intervention in person in session pre-pandemic, but when she got the form and we did it online together, within about three sessions, she's like, Diane, I got it now, even though this is the same thing you did, handing me that form, actually having it presented on Zoom, kind of like this course, um, I know how to handle my anxiety, and um, it was basically a CBT thought record, and it worked for her, and she's been great managing seasonal depression. So, um, and so these hybrid interventions really have a significant benefit to clients. They have access to higher quality care, access for special populations can access the specialized treatment that they need. There's more information, more flexibility, and there's a lot greater engagement like that one client. I'd done this intervention in session with her, but when we did it on Zoom and she got the you know, actual Word document, not a piece of paper, totally different outcome. And for client, for us, there's a lot of benefits. We establish ourselves as experts. We increase our hourly rate. There's um, more, a possibility for passive income and really free fund marketing um, that is not pushy. So a lot of good things. So 
Um, and so, yeah, and so with this um, training, I, I, I am kicking off a, a new course that I'm really excited about. It's a course that I'm calling Beyond the Hour because we all need to earn beyond the hour to make ends meet, to be able to retire comfortably, to be able to you know live comfortably. And so if you're interested in learning how to um, create hybrid interventions, I am starting a 90-day program in October where at the end of the 90 days, you will have some product that you can use with your clients and or you can sell it. Um, and I'm, it's going to be like a step-by-step -step guidance. I'm going to take a whole cohort through. Everyone's going to create something. We're going to create it together and support our, each other through this into this new era of uh, intervention. And and we'll be looking at about how to, I will be teaching you step-by-step step how to actually position yourself as an expert, how to you know, make sure that you are finding and using the best information we have available in the field, you know, how to use this um, as a very effortless, now pushing marketing, decrease the value of your services because you could charge more, obviously, if you're giving interventions. I looked at these courses that I've created, I mean, you would have to spend over a thousand dollars to to one on one to get that information. It's a huge savings for uh, clients and the potential to create passive income if you want to go in that direction, because there are lots of places that will sell these online psychoeducational courses for you. So you don't have to. So it will only be offered and I'm doing every session will be live if you like live things. It's October through December. And because you stay to the end of this workshop, um, you do get a coupon here. Right? Um, I will also put it into the chat. Um, so let me go ahead. I see there. Are, uh, go ahead if you've got questions about anything I've talked about today. And OK, so let's see. So David just posted a training magnet network on how to create training. Um, Craig is asking, how does a current feed paying client? There are two ways um, that a client um, would pay for this. One is you build it into it and you just give it to your clients. So you raise your rate, your hourly rate, I don't know, 15, 20 bucks an hour. You give it or you can sell it as a package or you can sell it as a standalone product like a book. You know, you can sell your books, you know, you, you can sell clients books, right? So you can either build it into your fee and give everyone something or you can have it be a standalone product. You could also create a package, you know, of six sessions, 10 sessions, 12 sessions. I know we don't do that a lot in this field, but I think it's a good model psychologically for clients as well as for ourselves to sell a package, you know, your parenting package. And so for six sessions, you get this course, you come see me six times, you know, and it's more of a coaching model. Um, but it's a good model to because there is something to limit, you know, having it time limited and focused um, and clients see that they achieve this goal and then they want to come back and get more from you. If you can have your clients achieve something and they feel like they achieve their goals with you, you have clients for life. Um, yes, yes, this is the flipped classroom uh, in psychotherapy and it makes so much sense. It, it really, it really does. Um, how much am I charging for my online courses? I, you know, you can make up any number you want because there's hardly a market on this, but I, I made my mini courses $97, which is my hourly rate is um, two to 250, depending on what I'm doing. And so it's about half of that, but it's, it's actually when I thought about it to get this information, you would definitely need to come see me um, for several sessions to get this much information out of me. So, yes. Uh, let's see. Okay, uh, Kathy, I don't know. Okay, I got to go back. I'm reading in reverse order here, folks. Um, oh, so Letty is asking about licensed works for a specific reason. So if you can create online courses that you're not the therapist. So if they're if you're just creating a psychoeducational course, it's like writing a self-help book. So you're creating a self-help course is what you are doing. So instead of reading a self-help book, they're going to watch a self-help course, um, which I think has a lot of strengths because I love to read, but I don't think most of the rest of the planet likes to read. And certainly watching videos is what most people are accustomed to. So yes, you can do this internationally. I have a, um, a, a group that, that they've, they've been nagging at me and I'm finally going to give them an online course. It's an internet. They sell things internationally. So you would, so what it does is it expands your audience. You can help people internationally, which is really an exciting thing to do. Um, 
uh, why should your clients pay for your version um, when there are other stars or when there are other people out there? You know, you know, Kathy, I, th um, I think it is because, you know, a lot of those experts don't speak to the, you know, to everybody. They really don't. Um, we need to have a diverse um, we need diverse experts with diverse areas of specialty and and clients not, you know, some of those really high level, you know, Sue Johnson EFT isn't going to resonate with everyone. And you know what, each one of us, you know, I think there is an art, there's definitely a science to this work, but there's definitely an art to this work. And no one teaches parenting the way I teach parenting, the way Kathy does it, the way someone else does it. We all end up with our little... Um, you know, spiels on how we teach it. I, I've come up with a, a you know, um, I, I teach parenting for Harry Potter fans. And I use the, the meta, metaphor of the three balls in Quidditch for the three different tasks of parenting. Because um, you're so I, I used to use the metaphor. It's like two, you know, playing tennis with two balls is what parenting is like. And anyway, so no one teaches it the way I do. And so I think each one of us, we come at it with our own spin and our clients want to hear from us. They want to learn from us and to build that relationship. And, you know, I don't think, you know, even some of the super, uh, you know, um, expert packages that are out there, first of all, they're probably gonna be more expensive than what some of us create, but that it's also not gonna resonate with everyone. Not everyone likes this huge, super fancy, super involved, multiple tiers. They want something simpler. So, and to bring our own voices. And so I have folks who are gonna signing up for this beyond the hour course who are gonna do it all in Spanish. You know, I have folks who are gonna do it for the deaf community. I have folks who are gonna do it for the military community. And so oftentimes we have our communities that we serve and we take this, we can take this knowledge and really deliver it, you know, for Southern California. I mean, dealing with body image issues in Southern California is different than other places because of Hollywood. <laughs> So, you know, I do a whole Hollywood spin thing when I do, you know, body image is issues in California. Um, I, there's some questions about um, are there limits on assessment that masters could do? So if uh, I think Carrie is asking here about um, forensics and you do, yes, every state has different laws about what type of forensic work uh, mental health each mental health license can do. And so, and some states are more limiting in terms of that. In California, we can, you know, doing forensic work like family assessments for high conflict divorce, you know, adoption assessments, that, that's something that MFTs in California do quite a bit. Um, but each state is a little bit different. Yeah, the, the ability to test, um, you would need to check with your state board or your I know we got folks from other countries here and other countries, what their boards are doing. And it is limited by the licensure laws in your state. Yeah, because you someone is saying, I wish I made 60K. I only made 20K. Uh, um, yeah, and, and I don't know when exactly, Katerina, you graduated, but um, yeah. And so my students are now making 60K, but they cannot buy a house with $15,000 down. So it's, it's a problem. Um, Oh, uh, uh, Queen is asking, um, I'm not a practical MFT and I'm not licensed. Will this course work for me? Absolutely. In fact, anyone who has any information to share, like doctors, chiropractors, anyone, you know, coach, life coaches who does any type of sharing knowledge <laughs> with other people, this course is actually good for. I, I am targeting it towards uh, mental health providers but I do have some life coaches. I actually have um, a golf pro because um, they teach uh, who wants to learn how to create online. Because one of the things I'll be teaching is online courses, online content creation, which affects any industry where you have knowledge that other people are interested in and, and want to learn from. So let's see here. Uh, oh, Katrina was saying back in 2013, she made $30,000. Wow. Um, let's see. That is amazing. Uh, so Lauren is saying there's another way of increasing your savings and is moving to a country with cheaper cost of living. Absolutely. Uh, and doing therapy through telehealth. Yes. And, and many people have moved to regions where it's less expensive to live. Um, but certainly if you can get up and move to another country with a lower cost of living, there are a lot of Americans who have to retire that way. I mean, it's 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 a problem. We need to talk about this more. Um, 
Would I recommend getting a certification in life coaching? Um, I don't know of any state that actually even, um, I mean, life coaching is more like having a private practice. You would be doing more, I would say, those package types of things. You certainly can combine um, the this content creation, online courses with life coaching is, is also a perfect fit. Um, and do you need to do it life coaching? If you can figure out, you know, how to make money that way and you want to do more of a, a life coaching thing, you keep your two businesses separate, it's certainly another way to make money. And it might be a fun counterbalance if you've got a very clinical job. Maybe instead of opening a clinical private practice, you do a life coaching, which is a slightly different type of work where you're focusing on wellness. It's very outcome oriented. I would say the emotions are a little more positive. And maybe that's your counterbalance to keep you from burning out. Um, okay. A police and resource. Oh, from, she's, oh, they're not getting the, the, um, the sharing. Okay. Yeah. Somehow let me see if I can at least chat here. So I will put the, the, uh, course itself. The link for the course is here. I will put the coupon for those of you who are still here and it's 20% off. And then I will go and find Yes, you, you can ask some specific questions. Yes, please. Let me see, there was, a, there was a link someone put in here and I will go ahead and do that. Here it is. Thank you, David. Mahalo, I believe David, I believe that's the David from Hawaii. Okay. Oh, you guys aren't seeing this. Uh-huh, here we go. It's interesting, I've never had, anyway, here we go. Here are your, oopsie. Go. I will continue we'll go to do that. Oops, here it is. Okay. And I've got to go grab the uh, link for this. Let's see. What are some other questions we have coming in? Okay. So, um, so go ahead. If you've got um, any type of questions, I will be answering them. Let's see. I'm just going to grab the uh, link to the course real quickly. Here we go. I really do know how to operate YouTube, I mean, Zoom after all these years. Okay. Let's see. So someone is asking if I move to another state or country, can I still practice in the state of my MFT licensure? These law, most states are allowing that. So I, as far as I know, most states continue to allow that. That could change in some states, but to my knowledge, I know in California, which is, you know, and in, in, in Hawaii, those are the two places I'm licensed. We can do that. But you want to check with the state that you're in and uh, the state that, that you're licensed in, most importantly. Oh, Letty's asking, are you, I'm going to do this course in the future. How many hours are required to be successful? Well, um, I, so you will have at least two years of access to all the material. I'll never teach it again live each week if you'd like to see me live um, or if that helps you. Um, it will be available, but it'll be more in a pre-recorded format. Um, I, you know, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to see what people need. I survey people. I do, you know, research and such. Um, how many hours per week? So I'm asking for five minutes, five days a week is the minimum time commitment to create a course. And then ideally trying to squeeze in um, a one hour to four hour, depending on how big your project is. Because um, I do want you at the end of 90 days, ideally, to have something, uh, you know, whether it's a YouTube video, whether it's an online course, whether it's a TikTok, I don't care what it is, but you will have something out there in the world establishing you as an expert and something that you can if you choose to make you know some passive income off of so um i would say you need a minimum of an hour there will be to create it depends how big your, what you want to create is um but i was at least a minimum of hour per week um in terms of you actually creating something there'll be two hours of listening to me which you most people you know, about half the people will come live. The other half listen to me while they're commuting to work. So there's two hours of recorded content each week. And then about, you know, I would say one to two hours of you creating something as well. If you if you want to stay with the 90 day schedule, you obviously don't have to. Um, someone is saying they have two jobs in private practice. Um, she has to choose in two months which job to keep. 
And the one is a W-2 with insurance based and the other is cash, um, but is reliant on the marketing. And she's only had one client in it. Ooh, yeah. I mean, if you'll start dealing with the system, putting people down for um, being a contract worker. Oh, you're wanting to buy a house. Yeah, I mean, with a, if you're, so, okay. So this person's got an interesting question around being W-2 um, and buying a house. It does help to have that steady income. If you don't, you normally need a year or two showing that you have stable income in your private practice. And then they, you know, uh, trust that your business makes money. Um, but again, in that situation, even just having a very small practice on the side, if you're able to, is a great thing. Yep, I think we've got that question. Oh, the price of the course. I didn't even say that, did it? It is, it is $12.95 and you get 20% off for being here today if you've stayed this late with that coupon. Just put the coupon in. Um, it's a, or it's, um, it's a little over $100 per month for 12 months is the payment plan. So, um, oh, okay. So yeah, this is a great question, Alfred. He's asking about um, if there are any, uh, what are the eth ethical considerations regarding confidentiality? And so what you do need to have with digital interventions that are 100% digital, you're, you know, you're not giving them to your client is to make it very clear that it is, you're, they are not your client for, you know, enrolling in a pre-recorded course, just like someone's not your client because they, you know, read your self-help book, right? So, but you do need to, have, you know, um, the ethical considerations is, and one of the things that we'll teach is to make sure everything you're saying is grounded in the field's literature base. And that really sets you apart from everyone else on TikTok and YouTube. I go crazy when you just watch anyone can say anything anymore <laughs> and record it. And there's almost like no consequences. Um, I think, well, we've seen that in a lot of ways. Um, so in, you're going to set yourself apart by being someone who provides high quality information, professional level information, and that is what is going to distinguish you. And you were, you know, I will teach that in this course because I think that is essential. Um, and so, so yes, you'll be, so you're ethically obligated to not um, promote nonsense as a mental health provider, even if they're not your client, because you have a license and if they know you have a license, you cannot just spout garbage which obviously in some other professions, I won't name them at the moment, um, you, you can, and you can get away with, with murder, just saying whatever you think is a free speech. We, we, we do need to say things that are true, that there's an evidence base and that there's a professional knowledge base you know, behind it. Um, and we just need to make sure that clear with clients that they are not your clients. I do not recommend having you know, chat options be available um, in these type of courses. Awesome. Raul, awesome. Raul, I will see you in October. Love it. Uh, great. Um, I, I mean, the course will be available um, pre-recorded in the future. What additional costs might there be? That's a great question, Larry. I am going to I am really a fan of doing all this work very inexpensively and cheaply. <laughs> so you I, I, if you want to do um, things like YouTube and TikTok, there is almost no cost at all to do those sorts of things. Um, I do, I do have, um, I work with, I, my courses are all on Kajabi. And so I am able, I will get people in the course a discount um, and Kajabi changes it, but you get a special discount because I will be giving it to you. And normally you get, I can extend your 30 day trial. So at least you'll get to practice on one and see if it's worth it. But really, I mean, Kajabi is what I use. Um, and I love it now on my private practice website is on Kajabi. So it has saved me lots of money to have an all-in-one, um, very streamlined. Um, I don't like to have a lot of overhead. I can't afford to have a lot of overhead. That's why I'm freaking out. We're looking at moving my private practice because overhead in this field, the, it, the numbers just don't work. So I will be talking about lots of ways to keep your overhead low because it's not a field you know, where we can afford a lot of extra. Yes, absolutely. Let's see here. Uh, is it worth becoming a supervisor? I'm thinking of getting uh, certified um, as a sex therapist. Is it ethical to refer EAP to my private practice? Um, so, I mean, being a supervisor, you normally are going to get paid that much more. Um, 
And it just depends if your agency is going to pay, but it's not a huge, because they're not making any money off of it. It's usually not a huge money maker. Um, you're getting paid as a sex therapist. That probably is a, is an area of specialty. People will pay more for. I agree with that. That kind of, uh, that would might be a, a specialization. Um, is it ethical to refer your EAP clients? That totally depends on what contract they have. You, you've signed with your, um, with the EAP. So it really depends on what kind of contract. Will this help with sports psychology practitioners? Absolutely. Anyone who's selling anything like physical therapists should all be doing this. I don't know if any of you have gotten physical therapy and they send you home with this list of stretches and exercises with this crazy little handout that was created 20 years ago. I go to a really good physical therapist, but I'm like, I, I, this physical therapist should all be having um, uh, online courses for their everyday client every single week because of the crazy things they would send me home with. I realized, you know, as a professional, I'm like, I, you know, they're not sending me home with enough information to actually benefit fully from physical therapy. And so we're, I think we're going to see this, you know, and I will let anyone into this course. I will talk about psychotherapy, but the um, principles are the same across every single medical industry for certain. But like I said, I've got golf pros who could take this class and learn how to make money, you know, certainly life coaches, all that. What if your ideas are not fully formed? That's perfect because that's exactly what we're going to do. And we're going to start. Uh, so the course will start and you're going to look at who are the clients you're currently seeing. We're going to identify and I will give you a list of some suggested topics. Um, in fact, next weekend, I will be doing another webinar related to this topic and I will give you lists of suggested ones that every therapist should have. Um, the simplest one to do is cognitive informed um, CBT for insomnia. There's just a book you can use. Um, you should obviously practice it a little bit yourself. Um, so there are things like that. There's just a lot out there. So if you, you know, you're going to pick one topic. I know many of you like to like get scattered and go in different directions. You're going to pick one topic and we are going to take that and we're going to produce one thing. Hopefully if you stay on course, you know, for in 90 days, you'll end up with something and it'll get you started. Um, so you don't need to know. I have, I'll give you a list to choose from. If you're not sure what to say, I'll give you a list of books to go to. Um, but certainly having an insomnia, as insomnia is um, common for over half the folks who come into mental health have insomnia. It's, it's a, a symptom across multiple depression, anxiety, psychosis, you know, substance use disorder, I mean, you name it, uh, you know, insomnia is really, really common problem and having an online intervention for that, they're very easy to create, very simple. It's a super simple one. There's a lot of CBT that translates really well couples work, parenting. There are, there are a lot of standard interventions that I think all of us should have um, available for our clients, sort of like physical therapists um, who should also uh, have this for us. So awesome. Okay. So your ideas do not need to be fully formed. Um, What's the return on investment? I, I actually hope for every dollar you make at least a hundred, if not a thousand dollars down the line, depending on where you are in your career. I, I, if you, I mean, you may not make that in your first year. I expect hopefully though, if you do either through YouTube, TikTok, um, or online courses, I, I hope that you can pay off this course at least, at least make back the money in a year. Um, and some of you are going to are, are going to be even more savvy than I am with these things, um, especially some of you who are younger. I think you're going to do laps around me. <laughs> um, but but so, I mean, even if you're early, I've had folks say, you know, I'm, I'm just in grad school or I'm just getting out of grad school. I'm like, oh, my God, like you have all the skill set <laughs> and you, you remember how to go find knowledge. You know how to do that from grad school. You're actually very well set up because they're much more digital natives than some of us who are later in our career. But when you're later in your career, mid career, wherever you are in your career, you you have a lot more experience to draw from, you know, and you might have your you know unique set of ways of teaching, you know, parenting or whatever, you know, mindfulness whatever it is. Um, yeah, mindfulness is another huge open area. And if you can, you know, I, I think there is a lot of mindfulness stuff out there, but it's real intimidating. And so my advice is if you want to do something on mindfulness, scale it down two to five minutes, very simple. Um, in my, you know, three anxiety hacks, I give them a three minute kind of structured mindfulness exercise, a three minute um, breathing exercise from mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. I just take that little snippet out because that's reasonable. Some will do that. So, um, so yeah, let's see. 
Uh, so yes, that will return investment. The, the webinars will be live um, on Sunday mornings. I have um, surveyed folks many times. They will be live Sunday mornings, um, 9 a.m. to 11 every single Sunday between now and, and uh, December 18th or October through December. Obviously, all of them will be recorded. They will be posted within a few hours after, you know, it takes a couple hours to render the video and upload it. Um, and I do know from experience, you know, lots of people don't make the live sessions. Um, and for some people, it's more important than others. Um, but I have found that Sunday and someone emailed me about today's, so they're like, why are you always on Sunday? It's like, well, it, this is the preferred time. I've tried Sunday afternoons, Saturday mornings, Thursday nights. Um, and by far, Sunday has been the majority of people can make that time. I know it conflicts with um, many folks who've got religious ceremonies on Sunday morning. But so many people work either on the third, you know, weeknights, private practice people are working. And on Saturdays, a lot of folks are working. And so when I poll people, Sunday morning keeps coming up as the top time. But everything will be recorded. You'll have access to those recordings for a minimum of two years um, and probably long after that. So you will always have those to refer back to. Oh, yes. You, so with copyright issues, obviously you cannot use anything directly from the textbook. So we will go over copyright law, how you're not going to infringe on other people's rights. And you get to copyright all of your stuff because I will teach you to create your own handouts, your own worksheets, you know, to um, add your spin to it. Um, you certainly cite, you know, um, things. Well, and actually you can sell the CBTI book and, you know, be an Amazon affiliate. You can recommend it, put your Amazon affiliate, you know, disclosure there and you'll make a passive income off of people buying the CBTI book, but you can have your, you know, one hour, you know, summary of how to do it and you can break them down into stages just like you were doing it in session. It, it really is going to be a very, very, um, you know, effective thing. But no, I definitely follow all copyright. Or as an author, I'm very sensitive to copyright because Cengage will definitely come after me if I violate it. So I'm more worried about being even in trap with my own stuff. Um, but I will teach you how to protect what you create as well as protect the rights of others. And and so, okay. Yes. What about things less uh, tangible like confidence and self-esteem? Well, you will be getting the imposter syndrome, my imposter syndrome class free, since I know that is an issue for a lot of people. Um, and I'm definitely going to tackle that. And and some of that is you, I am going to teach you how to be make your how to profess as a professional. You are a professional. Even when you're going through graduate school, you're being trained to be a professional. I am going to teach you how to to help you learn how to be very confident in accessing the knowledge base of the field. You know, and as an academic, I've, you know, I've learned to do this. And I don't think, you know, the way we have, when people leave and the way the field has evolved and your workload is so heavy nowadays, most masters, you know, professionals don't feel like they own the 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 knowledge base of the field, they they they're skittish around it because they've just been like do 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 produce produce bill bill hour bill bill hour bill bill hour you know go to this you know one training and then just work 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 work. So I am going to teach you how to learn how to access. You don't have to know everything in the field. You really don't, but you need to know where to find high quality knowledge and information, and which I think is essential. And that's what's going to set. People who come out of this course are going to create high level knowledge. They are going to distinguish themselves from the YouTube you know, folks. They're going to create high level professional knowledge and it's going to build your confidence. Um, and, and that you're going to learn how to make yourself an expert and feel like an expert. Um, and experts don't know everything, but they do know, you know, what is professional knowledge, what is not. Um, and they now conduct themselves, obviously, as an expert. But I think that's real important. Awesome. Thank you, Kathy, saying it sounds like a great course. Uh, Katarina saying, if you're already certified in something like Prepare and Rich, would it be illegal to utilize some of those ideas when creating the content? The ideas? No. The forms? Yes. So they have a lot of forms. Now, what you could do, though, is if you if you have a Prepare and Rich, you know, premarital package of eight sessions, let's say that you do with them and you use that Prepare and Rich, you can put some of that content into an online course for the couple, which they could there access, you know, um, you know, for years to come, depending how you set it up. So you can certainly create a much more cost effective premarital package, continue using the Prepare, Prepare and Rich 
add to it all the other stuff you tell them yourself that they will, you know, then you'll think about what would it benefit them to access, you know, in a year from now and two years from now. So you can create a, a, a premarital um, preparation package that's just a, more value to your clients and you're going to make more money if part of it's recorded. <clears throat> so you don't have to do that every single time. And that's where, you know, even if it's Normally you do eight hours and you can get two hours of that recorded. You've now increased your income by 25%. Doesn't that feel good? <laughs> Doesn't that feel good? You don't have to raise your rates. So you don't have to raise your rates or you could raise your rates. You know, you can handle it either way. There are different ways. Um, and, and being able to also add to that um, content that you've created is going to help your clients see you also as an expert. And you can have a little YouTube video that advertises your premarital you know, or TikTok, you know, that gives them whatever, five, 10 minutes. And I will teach you, I, I believe that we should be giving 10% of our information away, which is why, I, you know, I aim to give 10 to 20% of my, what I do, I give away for free. And if you really like it, people will buy more and you can do the exact same thing. And it's, it's pro bono, it's part of ethically what we should be doing. You're going to make high quality information available on YouTube or TikTok. People who really like you and your style, they resonate with you. They might sign up for the premarital package and you've given some high quality information to to everyone for free. So that is the basic marketing um, method I, I recommend. And I think it's a really ethical one. It's one where we help society. We make high quality content, you know, widely available. We're helping the world, actually. When you're on YouTube and TikTok, you are helping the world. Um, and, I, and that feels really good. Um. Larry is asking, I teach an MFT program. I'd like to provide this opportunity to my students. Many more students over the years are expressing interest in private practice. Will this be presented again, this, this workshop? Um, okay, so the webinar today, you will all get a link and uh, you can share it with you know, your friends. It'll be up for about um, a week, a couple of weeks, probably I'll have this available. I, I don't know if I'm gonna keep this long-term available just because then I get questions and, and then that actually adds work. So it's free, but I don't, I'm not going to work. It's free for a while. <laughs> Sometimes the free stuff, if you keep it free there for a long time, it adds to my workload. Um, the, the Beyond the Hour course, my plan is, and I will take feedback as we go along, if you like to be on the cutting edge and with me, and we, um, we will be uh, going through this journey. But I, my intention is to create some kind of uh, continuing the uh, Beyond the Hour course um, They'll either be entirely pre-recorded or just with some like periodic coaching sessions is what the future will look like. Yes, is there a risk of a dual relationship issue in selling um, my clients' products? You know, with my clients, I'm going, I think the better model with your clients is to at least provide some of it, what's relevant to them for free. Um, to make it or not free, but part of the fee of coming to see you is they get access to you can get access to a library of self help courses. I mean, what an awesome thing actually to be able to give your clients. So, but it's not a dual relationship if you make it very clear and you write up the language and we'll go over how to even do some of the legal part of making it very clear when you're a therapist when you're not because you can have it a standalone, you know. Um, you, there shouldn't be pressure. They sh your clients should not be required to purchase these courses from you. If it's required, I would make build it into your fee typically or build it into a package. Um, but it's just like I have a self-help book. My clients, you know, they can buy it. They cannot. Um, and and that's not, it's not unethical for me to say, hey, I have a book that relates to, you know, uh, my mindfulness for chocolate lovers. It, it might be a book you might enjoy if you like my sense of humor and learning how to manage stress. I have a book about that and you can check it out. So it, it would be low pressure. You can check it out. You can let them know it's available. It can be on, normally it's just going to be on your website. You're not going to be necessarily pressuring them. Um, but I, I, I'm starting to just give it to my clients for free and you can figure out which way it works for you. And, and, you know, it's as long as it's you're you're clear in the boundaries. Yes. Yeah, selling things to your clients um, as long as you're clear on all of those boundaries. Are you going to be working with a group? I will be giving individual guidance, both online. There's a huge online co component to all of this. And I will be going through and giving coaching both online because um, we'll have their, their little sessions where you're going to you know post what you've done every each week and I'll be giving you feedback there as well as there'll be live coaching time you know 
um, in the course itself. And I hopefully we'll uh, we'll see how it goes. I know I have about at least two or three Spanish speaking uh, clinicians who are going to work on Spanish speaking courses. And I'm going to try see we're going to see if we can like group up um, around topics or areas of specialty as well, or what you want to create. We might have TikTokers or YouTubers or online course folks. Um, so each group, um, uh, hopefully you'll also get support that way to be able to network and connect with people doing similar types of products. And I really don't think there's, you know, it's like if you if you just go look on, just, just go to YouTube or TikTok, whichever, and just like do a random search. I don't know, whatever your topic is, and you're going to find 40, 50 people probably have done it. There is space. I don't feel like there's this, you know, stiff competition anymore. Um, and I, I'm, you know, I, I think actually working together because um, everyone has their own voice, you know, and so I, there's a place for everyone in this world. I, I think it's one of the one of the there's there are some things that are very problematic, I think, about the Internet and how social media. One of the things that has happened is there's a place for everyone to have a voice and a unique spot in the dialogue. And you will find your tribe and your audience. Everyone has a tribe out there who is interested in the way they teach. And there are going to be some people who aren't interested in you. You know, not everyone likes my style and that's okay. And there's some people who do. And so um, you're going to just find your tribe and your people. And there is, there is a group out there for you. I promise. Oh yes. Uh, to the YouTube feed. Okay. I, I should probably. Um, yes. Okay. Wow. You are uh, Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. You want me to repost all of this? Because yes, the way that, let's see, there is the um, the course link and the coupon for being here. Go. Awesome. Okay. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, and so there is there is a cap on the uh, number of participants um, because and and so yeah I will be working on giving people um, you know as much one on one attention as possible. Okay, awesome. Let's see. I think hopefully um, I have answered everyone's questions and. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions. So you can actually, I can put my, uh, I'll give you my email. See? Let's see. Let's see. I'll give you my best email actually right there. So you can email me if you've got questions about the course. Um, you can go to my, you know, the Therapy That Works Institute webpage, and there is a contact form there. It's another way to reach me. Um, so feel free to reach me with questions. This course is enrolling through September 30th. Um, definitely keep your coupon code. I see, um, actually, I see some hands are raised. And I didn't even, let's see here. So, if, you know, if, um, I don't know why. It's allowing you to raise hands, but it's not allowing me. Or maybe if I go here, let's see. Let's see here. Okay. Queen, let me see. I'm going to allow you to talk. I'm going to unmute you, okay? You're unmuted, Queen. What is your question? See? Oh, she's not there. Okay. And I'm not, it's not coming through. And Mahala, I'm going to allow... Hello? You. Oh, yeah. Hi. Mahala, oh, you... hi. Hi. I'm doing okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, oh. Yes, yeah, so I have a question. Uh, I think you answered my first question. Yeah. Okay. And uh, yeah, my my yeah my second question was um for someone who because I graduated in twenty fourteen, mm -hmm. uh, for my uh, master's degree program in California. Um, I've not been practicing for many years because when I moved to um. Maryland, I was told I cannot practice unless until I get the uh, the national um, yes. like the national MFT 
a license and then I can practice as an associate. Yes. Even though I had in California, I had uh, completed yep. Yep. about 150,000 hours. And yep. yeah, yep. so. That's how licensing works in the United States. Um, so wait, what is your question? Is that normal? Is that right? So, so yeah, so my question is, um, would I be able to still, um, address, let's say if I want to create a YouTube channel, mm -hmm. will I be penalized for not having a license yet? I'm discussing. No, no, no. Subjects that relates to. Yeah, you're, you're, you're a therapist creating content. So you're not, uh, you don't have to be licensed I mean, you know, you can, I, I would just be totally honest. I'm licensed in California and having to, you know, earn one in Maryland, even though I've been practicing for 10 years, because that's how it works. Um, I, I was not licensed in California. I was only, um, I'd done my practicum, you so, know? So, yeah. So then, I, I'm just, but I was just an associate in California. Okay. But when I moved here, my uh, California uh, associates and, um, what will we say license or mm -hmm. yeah it's a license yeah it got expired so I'm not renew <laughs> it up to date yeah then you have a master's degree in mental health so your yes master's we're not used to thinking our master's is worth much but our master's degree is all you need and that's going to be the credential you cite not your license so you're okay you a master's you have a master's degree you have a graduate degree so those are going to be your credentials yeah you don't you want to be totally honest with how you market yourself um, okay and so yeah that would be yeah you add it's a great thing to do because there are a lot of people who get these degrees they either move um or you know they aren't they choose not to use the degree like they get burned out it's too emotionally draining to do the work and then mm -hmm. but yet you have a master's degree and i know most people have imposter syndrome and don't feel like they know anything but you did learn something you did learn how to you know you learned a, a foundation for the field mm -hmm. um, and if you didn't learn how to access the knowledge base of the field in a reliable way i will teach you how to do that in this course awesome um, and so, yes, you have a master's degree. So awesome. Great question. I love it. Because I think there are a lot of people in your shoes. I have people go through my program. They're like, I realize, you know, I, I just can't talk to people about their problems for 30 hours a week without coming home totally drained. So um, there are people who get this degree and they can't, or sometimes it's like you, it's like I switch states and the laws are so wacky. Um, so it's definitely a nice uh, thing to do. And I think you're just totally honest with that. So great. Good. Great question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for answering my question. Absolutely. Uh, Maha, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute if you're still with us. I don't know if you are. And Carrie, you'll be next. Hi, Maha. Are you there? Okay. Okay. Uh, Carrie, go ahead. I, Maha did not. She took her hand down. Okay. So Carrie, I'll go ahead and ask your question. And then Tiffany, you'll be next. Hi, Diane. It's just good to see you. Good to see you. Um, so I, I'm here not with a question, but to enthuse. I feel like you have unlocked, you have solved an issue for me. I'm trained as a coach and a therapist, and I help medical patients that are a specialty population, usually with non-clinical interventions around um around their medical condition as well as for their families. And I feel like what you are providing right now is like the antidote to the burnout and the either or. Like this is, this is a way I feel like by creating non-clinical content, but leveraging all of my experience and credentials, I, I just, I'm seeing a path forward and I can't thank you enough. Awesome. Awesome. And there's so many people in this field who this makes more sense. I mean, even as I, I was putting it, these courses together, which they've been on my to-do list for years, um, I, you know, I, I've done these Zoom things with clients. As I put a full course together for a client, I'm like, oh my God, this makes so much sense. So I'm excited for you. You've got this whole specialty area and I think it's going to be huge. Just like with my physical therapy, you know, handouts, <laughs> you, you've got that medical knowledge to really 
any anyone in the medical field too. So this is awesome. And for coaching too, I think this online course thing, because they do less process, they aren't supposed to be processing most emotions that much. So I think for coaches too, this makes a ton of sense since they do more of an information download than mental health folks do. Yeah. And I, and just another tip from the process that I just went through uh -huh. um, in my head in the last you know 15 minutes is like identifying your niche and how you partner like instead of replicating what others are doing is there something unique about what you do that you add as yep. a multi you know on a multidisciplinary team or however you work that's where i'm feeling like i have the confidence now to do something to confidently deliver the added value i provide instead of just replicating what others do and just i just want to leave that nugget for other people who might be struggling with confidence over it Oh, I love that. Absolutely. That's a great idea, too. It's like the field is wide open and it's just I think it's an exciting time to be looking at doing this. Um, and it's really from the pandemic. We learned how to master all this. Everyone got comfortable learning online, being on Zoom. And so it's really going to transform us in so many ways that I think are going to be really positive. It's a win win for the clients. It's a win win for us. Um, and I think it's the only sane way through in this field. So I love your vision, Carrie. That's awesome. Great team. Thank you for your offering. Absolutely. Okay, Tiffany. You are able to talk now if you're able to unmute. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Um, my question is question slash dilemma. Right now, I, I had joined a private practice. Um, with a colleague about um, two months ago, mm -hmm. and we offer couples counseling. I love doing couples counseling, but I have lost three clients because, or potential clients, because um, my business partner, he has this thing in our package that any couples that come in have to make a $250 deposit to be able to use access uh, the Gottman um institute which i understand but i'm losing clients and i don't know how to like say can we maybe lower it i don't know what to do because like right now i need these people and that that having to do that deposit up front i'm like maybe can we switch it it's making me lose clients at least i feel wow well see so this is where you could create something I mean, if, I mean, it sounds like you need to renegotiate that agreement um, with your with your partner there, but you could also create something that's similar to and provides a similar function to the um, to the Gottman training. That's interesting. I didn't know that you there were Gottman was it makes sense. Gottman's doing this because I, I I didn't Gottman's evidence informed that evidence space, but yeah, so Gottman's got something like this as well. So, but it's too, it's expensive. It's not for everyone, and so I think seeing if you could create something that doesn't cost that much, <laughs> so that you're not losing clients to have a, a, a second option um, is certainly something you could do. I don't know if that answers your question, Tiffany. It did. Thank you. Yes, I I have to find something else. I think the fee is mainly because of the assessment because the, the Gottman assessment is like. Yeah. about three pages long front and back and it's a lot of time i get it but at the same time at this time people therapy is kind of a luxury yeah. <laughs> especially for couples especially yeah for couples. no it is it is and that's we're trying to make this more affordable um you know when you're working if you're tr you know this this has a, a potential to make therapy more affordable to, to more people which is i, I think exciting so but yeah, and it sounds like your partner's model is, you know, doesn't allow for that. Um, but that's definitely something uh, I would I would talk to them about and see if you can find some other alternative. Cool. So okay, I got some Thank more you. questions. You're so welcome. Um, Valerie, why don't you go ahead and unmute? <clears throat> Hi. Hello. So first of all, I want to say tomorrow I'm taking my exam and I am a total basket Woo! case today. Oh my God. I took your study course. I tried and I feel like I have all this information roaming around in my head and I'm just hoping that it makes sense tomorrow. But yes. the reason yes. that I'm interested in this and I just paid for this to be in this group 
is because oh. I started oh, this one second, one second, one second. exam and I am a total basket. Uh huh. Let's go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So the reason that I just signed up for this is because I started this journey because I have a huge craft room and I would have ladies over and we would do these crafts. And I didn't realize I had all single friends. Like I did not realize this. And one day they're talking about dating apps. Half of the table is all religious showing off their dating apps. The other half, and I had like 10 people were showing off like personal parts, like sex uh, related dating apps. And I'm sitting in the middle and I can't even say sex at that point in time out loud. I would have been married for like, I don't know, 15 years, but that's just not something I talked about. And so then I'm like, oh, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. You know, at like trying to get people to just stop talking. And I went and talked to a friend that was a psychologist and he said, oh, you need to become, you know, somebody told me I need to become an art therapist. He said, no, you need to become a therapist. So now here I am. And now I want to marry together my crafting and my therapy base. And I was thinking about doing it online. I don't ha have a clue how I would do it, but I'm hoping that this course can help me figure it out. Wow. Hello. Oh my goodness. Hello. Let's see here. I, the whole thing crashed, didn't it? Wow. Hello. Hello. Let's see here. Are you there still, Valerie? Can I, can you try speaking again, Valerie? I am here. Can you hear me? Valerie is talking and I am not hearing you. Oh, I know why. Hold on. Can you speak again, Valerie? Yes. yes. Oh my God. My, I am hardwired to the internet and I just had a whole new system installed and it just crashed, but I'm here. Oh. Um, at least my other computer's here. So I heard that you were crafting and that uh, your friends were single and talking about dating apps and yeah. uh posting about sex and then it crashed wow talking about sex crashed my uh, uh computer go. today there you go so i was freaked out because i didn't know what to do and they're swapping phones and totally okay with showing each other like the different dating apps one half is all like religious the other half is like personal parts and I got married before dating apps were a big deal. So I'm like, let's just cut this. Let's just glue this. I am like a basket case. And I had friends that were, I have a friend that's a psychologist. And so I went to talk to him and somebody said, oh, you should be an art therapist. And he said, absolutely not. You should be a therapist that does art therapy. So that started my journey to my master's. Mm -hmm. And I have a YouTube channel. Awesome. A couple. Well, I have a YouTube and a Facebook. I really don't know what I'm doing with it. I've posted a couple things here and there on crafting stuff, but I was thinking I really want to marry crafting and therapy kind of together, but I don't really have a clear idea on how to do it. And I'm horrible with like the Facebook thing is just, I'm like, I don't know if this is working the YouTube, my son set this all up for me, but then he kind of jumped ship and was mm -hmm. like, okay, you can do it now. And I am lost on how to do all of this. So I'm hoping is this kind of, I signed up for your course already. So I've already paid for it. Okay. But, um, is this something that is like, I can develop this idea and start work. Is that what this course is about? Yes. Yes. That's brilliant. It's funny. One of my colleagues at the university, she's a total, she's a quilter. She's a crafter. And one of my long-term clients is, a, is a crafter too. And mm -hmm. so I, I think you've got a brilliant idea because there's just a lot. And, and it's, it's a real important way for some women to connect other women and to find support. And I think it's brilliant. So okay, okay. absolutely, you know, and what, you know, what we are going to focus on in this course and my strategy is pick one YouTube, you know, or Facebook or whatever, you know, you want to, to want it to be. And I would probably just go with YouTube because um, I happen to know from my client, there's a huge YouTube crafting communities out there. 
Um, it's how she stayed connected, stayed connected during the uh, pandemic. So we talked about it quite a bit. Um, so pick one and be successful at it. So we're, we're going to pick a small goal, a, a single item and, and learn to be successful and then build upon that. Um, and if you're spread out too thin, because all of us have full-time jobs for the most part, who are going to be in this course. So you're going to start small and get success. And then you're going to keep building off of the sex success where most people crash and burn is they spread themselves too thin. They have too big of ambitions and, and it doesn't come to fruition and they give up. So okay. I'd rather you create two products and be successful with that than to plan a big one that you can't finish um, over the course. Cause you're going to have a lot of momentum from being in a group of people like this. Okay. So I will go YouTube. I know I already have a YouTube channel. I just don't Perfect. know how to access it. I have to get back. It's called creative with you. Nice. That's my kind Love of it. tag. Um, Love it. Anyway. So, but today I have to get through today to tomorrow morning. My test starts at like 8 AM and wow. I tell okay. people, I just randomly have been crying. I am so like, I tr I've tried everything. I think it's funny to be a therapist with anxiety because I'm trying to help people and I'm a, a hot mess. <laughs> but I tell people don't, don't mind my crying. I am not a crying person. So my friends are all freaked out. I got, and I'm a military, like my husband was in the military. I raised four kids. He's retired now. All of these things that I've done that have been pressure and this test, I just start crying and I tell people it's just because I have so much knowledge in my head that that's like my release. That's my release valve is my tear ducts. And so just don't mind it. But <laughs> yeah, I'm a complete basket case right now. You know what? Just keep doing it. You got probably got all excited about this new vision, but right now just do your mindfulness, get ready for that test, get as focused as you can. So you can remember everything you studied and go on with your life. Yeah. So. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much for your time. Okay. You are so welcome. Awesome. Okay. So someone is saying, oh, will I address TikTok? Yeah. We'll talk about TikTok. My niche is teens and young adults. Um, yeah. That is the crowd who really loves TikTok. Um, TikTok is like YouTube, but vertical. Um, it is easier to start get it to being a paid channel on TikTok. Um, so, you know, pick one or the other, unless you really have the time to record in both formats. Um, but you're going to get a younger audience and it's a little bit easier to get those um, paid, you know, to get paid um, to make get a passive income on TikTok a little sooner than YouTube. Typically, I guess I got back on screen before I knew it. Yes, yeah, so I don't know what you guys were seeing when my uh, computer crashed. That is so bizarre because I am hardwired to a high speed. I had to have my whole Internet upgraded recently. Or did you just say Gottman assessments only charge 30 per client? So I, who knows what Tiffany's thing was doing? Uh, what, what is our RBT experience? How, how do you reach a collaborative approach? Um, I'm not exact. Uh, Tania, if you're still here, I'm not sure what, which RBT. There's REBT is normally the one I think about. Rational behavior therapy, I'm guessing. How do you um, reach a more collaborative approach? I'm not quite sure what that means, but if you, um... oh, what is the coupon code? Is capital BTH20. I hopefully you found that again in the, um, in the course. The start date is October 2nd, um, but it's all gonna be recorded. You can take it at your own pace. You'll just be able to, you know, attend live if you want to this, this particular go, go round. Interesting, oh. So the, the code is um, BTH, I'll put that in there, BTH20. There we go. I don't know what happened to my chat. I've always had that be the default, so I'm not quite sure. Okay, but it looks like I've answered most of the questions. Oh, we're, oh a registered behavior technician. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, so so for that, um, um, I think we call it ABA in California. I'm not sure where you're at. Uh, and I don't even know if we have an RBT in California. Um, so, I mean, there's certainly lots of stuff in that that you can also put online. And, you know, I, a lot of our behavior technicians in California, I don't know if you work, you know, work with kids and families on the spectrum, 
and just think about how they really should have a library. I mean, for parenting, it really does help to have a library of um, how to handle things. I remember my eldest child needed to be sleep trained. My youngest did not. Um, and I, you know, I, there, I got the book and then I got the video and the, I, I just later tell people don't even buy the book, just buy the video, watch the video and do what it says. And so for the behavioral interventions, like sleep interventions, parenting, having a video is so much more helpful than a book. It really is harder to learn out of a book for most people. And I, I think just the way knowledge has become so multimedia I think it's harder for people to learn from books. I learn well from a book. People in master's degree programs learn well from books. That's how they get to master's degree programs. Um, so I think there's a lot of behavioral stuff translates very well, obviously, because it's behavioral um, to a more video type of format. Yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, uh, Tania, yes. So, she, you know, having a specialty, especially that, you know, she's an ex-military spouse, has an adopted son. She's got a lot of behavioral experience. So you, you, you're going to create a very clear tribe um, very quickly and easily. So, um, and so, yeah, you have a lot of, and that you bring that life experience and people really do appreciate it. And that's why not all of this is going to be delivered by experts, you know, and so definitely, uh, I think that's a great background. And there were people, when I, I did a focus group about how to create the course, and I definitely had at least one or two people who were planning on, you know, serving military families and spouses. I mean, there's just so much. The military is a, <laughs> it's a hard place to be. All the teenagers out there right now, I mean, there are research studies that show you, you give teenagers just an online course in college. And it was as effective as seeing a therapist. I mean, that is stunning to just give youth this knowledge. Uh, my, um, and I have done this with a lot of my, my teens also, just giving them some simple things that they can do to take care of their stress and anxiety and depression that so many teenagers are experiencing right now. And youth, I, you know, I, I've got kids too. They're, they're all going through tough times. Um, and to, to make this information more readily accessible is really, uh, I think, a gift to a lot of people. So the days um, that we are going to be um, live is going to be uh, Sunday mornings, Sundays from 9 to 11 Pacific is just, and it's every single Sunday between now and um, December 18th are the live times. Um, and so that's when you will, uh, you will, um, you can watch it there, but we're, we will have the videos up by the end of Sunday afternoon so that um, you can listen to it, you know, anytime afterwards to keep up, you know, with the class. There'll also be tons of interactive stuff online. Um, so you can get your questions answered either, you know, online or through the live sessions. It doesn't matter. I will say, you know, the majority of most folks do end up um, taking the uh, um uh, doing everything with the recording and using the online chat. Cause I do go in there and answer people's questions and really try to give you a ton of support. Okay. <clears throat> oh, the dates, um, the course, the first live session will be uh, Saturday, Sunday, October 2nd. It goes through December 18th, and it is uh, Pacific time is 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. It's about two hours, and which is noon East Coast time. It's four or five in um, UTC, kind of the um, London time, something like that. So though that's and that's just because most I've polled my students over the years, and this seems to be the best average time. I know it doesn't work for everyone, but that's, um, and if there are um, other folks who, uh, and, and, and you know, depending on what, you know, what this particular group is, we might add some different times as well. I will also just check and see how things go for everyone in the course. Oh, wow. Lots of questions still. Um, so types of things people have created, well, I've never taught this course before. 
So um, I don't have quite have examples, but I, I do have a focus group that I was working with. And so people were looking at creating, um, you know, uh, there were, like I said, there were some who were going to create courses uh, for the military to provide mental health information to families in the military, to couples in the military, um, working uh, in Spanish, providing um, online courses in parenting, in mental health, and supporting kids and supporting youth, um, and having those available in bilingual, bicultural, you know, therapists, it's really huge. And that's very difficult. Um, in California, we don't have enough bilingual therapists. You know, even when we want to provide bilingual services, agencies are struggling to do so. And so, especially when you have a specialty like that, um, this is really going to be a way forward. And it, it reduces so many barriers to people getting treatment. You know, because you don't have to drive someplace, it doesn't it doesn't cost as much. Um, you don't have to wonder about whether you're, the therapist is going to understand you or like you, or if you're going to connect with them. There's a there's a type of agency and autonomy that comes with it. So for a lot of what I was most surprised about was that for so many marginalized communities, um, that these online interventions, they liked them better. It was easier. They didn't have to overcome barriers to get as many barriers to getting treatment. They could do it at home on their own time, you know, and um, a lot of the a lot of the research they actually were using telephone is even before Zoom, because they've been written these, they've had these online interventions for about 20 years. So I didn't, I didn't even realize there were so many out there. Um, but most of it has been through research and a lot of which is with phone call, call follow-up, um, not even the actual, um, what do you call it again? Uh, Zoom, which I think now would be the more common way to do this. So I think there are going to be a lot of people who can, um, connect with communities. I mean, we just had someone who's got adoption, ex-military, and what was the other variable? <laughs> there were three of them. I, um, oh, and, and behavioral experience. So I think there's a lot, um, you can be doing out there. Um, how many uh, have my master's as an MFT pursuing licensure, but it is a difficult process in Maryland. She's working on creating, oh, a more straightforward to guide MFTs through the process. Yes. Okay. That's so you're going to actually maybe create a, it sounds like you're going to be supporting MFTs through the process. That's great. Um, Carrie, those courses are, I'm recording something every week. Um, you don't have, no one has to, you don't have to show up for all of it. Um, so, uh, and actually I made myself work on Thanksgiving so that I end up with a nice 24. I, I like even numbers. So I'm any, I am actually doing it Sunday of Thanksgiving. I believe, I think I, I wavered on that, but I think I left it in there. So I will have a series of 24 videos for the, uh, pre when the course becomes pre-recorded, I have an even number. So yes, every single week I will be meeting. You don't have to make it all. You can watch me while you're, you know, commuting or doing dishes or whatever. So, um, so yeah, okay. Wow, there are still people here. It's amazing. Um, anyone else have any questions? Awesome. Okay, so you can find the course at therapythatworksinstitute.com. You all have your coupon capital B-T-H-20. That's beyond the hours, what that stands for, if it helps you remember it. Uh, we are registering through September 30th, so feel free to register until then. And let me know. CEs are not available for psychologists. Uh, no, I have the MBCC, which gets most of the master's level. Most states honor the MBCC. I also have the California and MFT one, but sorry, not for psychologists. I'm I'm not a psychologist and there's a lot more involved to that, but to, to doing that for psych, maybe in the future, but I, I, at this point, I'm not doing psychologist CEs. Clearly been on the website. Good research. Glad you found that. Okay. Any other questions? Pop, you can pop them in the chat. I'm real excited about this because I think, you know, um, I just think it's it's this is the way forward. It's really exciting to be doing some of this. Um, I think it is going to personally benefit a lot of people in the field. 
um, who are incredibly talented and just unfortunately the way we get paid um, makes it hard to make a decent living. Well, I was sharing this idea with someone. They also pointed out the reason the million dollar, the millionaire next door is typically a plumber um, or someone who doesn't even have a bachelor's degree is because when you graduate from high school, start working full time, you know, get your, you know, let's say contractor's license on the side, you start earning money well before someone who has a bachelor's and you don't you know, spend a hundred thousand or more in education. And so you don't have that huge debt. And so on. And the third piece to it was you often don't have such an expensive uh, taste in living. So um, you spend less. And so that's why the millionaire next door is typically someone who doesn't have a college degree, um, is in some kind of trade, has been working straight out of college and lives a relatively, you know, simple life. So, um, but there are, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an amazing field. I love what I do. I love how we, you know, I love what we do as professionals. I think it's an incredible career, but I, I think it is surprising after you go through all those years of education to, to see what you're getting paid at the end um, and how difficult it is then to make a life for yourself. So at least we all have, um, I think, meaning and inspiration. So Awesome. Oh, uh, Reggie is asking you, do you need a, um, a license? Absolutely not. In fact, there are people who don't need a license, uh, who, who don't have licenses and don't even plan to get a license. So no, you definitely do not need a license. You can be a graduate student. I think some grad students are going to do some amazing things for this course. Um, Letty, awesome. So you're going to be there in October. Great to hear it. So no, and I, there definitely are coaches. I have people who aren't necessarily even therapists who are going to be in this course. Um, I, I will allow them in because it's relevant to everyone. They have to listen to me talk about therapy examples. <laughs> but if they um, just want to go through this process on how to create online content in various ways. Um, awesome. Awesome. So uh, to me, I hope I'm saying it right. Yeah, you're you're uh, you've been thinking about doing this for a while, so that is really I'm awesome. This is this is great. Yeah, and this is also just to create the support in doing it because it, it's there's work up front. There's a lot of work up front. I'm not going to lie about that. Um, but to do it as a group, to do it with support, to problem solve together, um, we're kind of on a cutting edge of technology. I think it's real exciting, and I definitely think it's um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Larry says for CEs, he needs to provide my bio and course outcomes for uh, Minnesota. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, well, my bio is on the form, but I can also email it to you in a, in a, in a, in a manner which they would be uh, happier to see it in. So absolutely. And um, the course outcomes are, I think, in the drop down FAQ section at the bottom. Um, but I can also email it to you, uh, Larry, if you need that. Um, I didn't know about that requirement in Minnesota. It's good to know. Very good to know. Awesome, awesome. Okay, well, I'm excited that people are excited. And, oh, uh, uh, Tania, you have six kids and a lot of ideas. Oh, uh, yeah, well, you know what, kids, uh, each one costs about a um, half a million dollars. <laughs> uh, 300,000 before age 18. Yeah, they're expensive little critters. Um, it's expensive to have kids and childcare during the pandemic. I've got a, it, that was no joke. So absolutely. And, and, you know, I was talking with one of my colleagues, she's like, you know, cause I do work a lot. I work a lot. Um, I will admit that. And, but I'm a single mom with two kids and I've got to support them and it's expensive. So the reason I learned to do all of this was because I had kids, uh, honest to God, you know, I would probably not work this much if it was just for me, but when you've got kids and family, you know, you, um, you will do whatever you can to make their life as good as you can. So I, I do think this is a great option for parents also because it's flexible. Um, and I, I think that's real important for parents as well. So I love that. Uh, yes, but they do help me with a lot of experience. I'm guessing your kids. Yeah. Oh yeah. Those parents, those kids, they educate, they educate us as much as we educate them. So love it. Love it. Love it. Well, thank you all for hanging out. Even as I, um, my, my computer crashed. I can't believe this is so bizarre. My other, my big computer crashed. So I'm on my backup computer, but hopefully, um,
we uh, it all worked out and thank you all for being um patient with that okay so if there are any other questions oh here they're coming oh hello evelyn thank you thank you um good to see you you are always so kind and awesome so please if you got any last questions you can pop them in the chat um i hope i inspired you to get thinking about i mean new ways this is this hybrid therapy i, I think is going to be very useful to a lot of our clients and to our communities and and also to us personally to to deal with the pay problem in the field and i i love it i i, I just now call it a pay problem and um and just thinking about how to continue doing this work while also taking care of ourselves i think it's really important okay well i thank you all for hanging out with me um thank you all for hanging out with me and being patient with the technology thank you um Tania, and I know I'll be seeing some of you uh, in the in the course. Check your email. I'm doing another webinar next week to just really dive into hybrid therapy um, and some of the possibilities there. I'll actually go into some. Someone was looking for ideas about what to create um, hybrid courses on, so you're welcome to do that. Those of you who've signed up, you will get recordings of all of this. Um, I'll put them also in the courses for you if you ever want to reference them. Um, but please, um, and also, you know, if you just want to learn more, there is, you know, come next week to the uh, web uh, Zoom. I'll be doing another Zoom webinar on uh, therapy in the digital age, where we will go over into more depth what these hybrid interventions are. So, hope you're all well. Yes. Oh, Carrie's she's loving this therapy education or co coaching. Yes, it works for all of them. Um, Oh, I don't. Well, how long will I don't? The courses, um, these free webinars, I would typically make them available for a couple of weeks for free. You'll get a there's a will be a web page with a link. You can watch rewatch everything. If you join the um, beyond the beyond the hour course, we will definitely have the recordings of these webinars available for anyone who wants to rewatch them. Okay, love it, everyone. Thank you so much. You be well. You take care.